Our speaker is with, uh, with, the, with the Schaffler Group, USA, in Troy, Michigan. He is representing the American Bearing Manufacturers Association. You can read his, his bio on, our, on, on, on the ESA app. Uh, our speaker is uh, he's, he's, he's director of, uh, of intellectual property for the Schaffler Group Americas and has been involved in, in ongoing cases and investigation of, of counterfeit bearings. Please welcome Anton Fikovic. Thank you. So sort of a very, very select group this morning. You guys are targeted audience. Yeah, so Jerry, uh, I actually spoke at the ESA convention in Reno in uh, S September, and my tales of daring do, I guess, got me invited to the international one. So if you have any questions, obviously, this is a very, very unique, very select group. So if you have any questions, please feel free, free to interrupt. Uh, I know we're supposed to keep questions to the end, but, you know, that's all right. So, I'll start with a video, rather than hearing me speak. Uh, I'm supposed to start with the video. Maybe not. That's a good start. Yeah. Wherever there are premium products, there might also be fakes. <laughs> Some fakes make you laugh while others could be harmful or even fatal. Like fake bearings. In fact, business operations, productivity, safety, and many things in our everyday lives rely on bearings. If a counterfeit bearing is accidentally mounted, it could put operations and lives at risk. Fakes often look exactly like the original but they don't always perform the way you'd expect and pay for. It's a problem in all markets, all segments, and for all sizes and types of bearings. And it's a big business for counterfeiters around the globe. A fake bearing could result in annoyance or expensive downtime or warranty costs. A fake critical bearing could result in disaster. Guard against putting fake bearings in your products. Use trusted sources for all your bearing purchases. Because one fake bearing could break your business. So in case you didn't hear that, said one fake bearing can break your business. But we could have jacked up the volume a little bit just to wake you up. But. Um, so in any case, I don't know why I start with that video because basically it says the whole presentation. <laughs> That's it. Thanks, everybody. All right, so uh, we're actually redesigning this website, but the point there, a few key points to take away, and uh, if you've done presentations before or you've attended presentations before, you know that repetition means memory. So I'll repeat some of these items throughout the presentation. Hopefully you guys will actually remember them. One of the key points, uh, well, two of the key points was uh, and that spider web shooter map of the globe where it goes from country to country. Fakes can come from any country. So they typically come from China and in India, but they can end up in Germany, they can end up in Mexico, they can end up in the U.S., and they can be sold from any country. So don't be uh, mistaken or uh, lulled into a sense of complacency simply because it's coming from a, a trusted country. Anyway, so again, my name is Anton Pikovic. I work for Scheffler. Uh, they're a huge bearing manufacturer, I think maybe one or two in the world. Uh, SKF is number one, but uh, there's a bunch of other bearing companies that I'll go through. And we're part of the uh, American Bearing Manufacturers Association, which is also part of the World Bearing Association. You wouldn't think there'd be that many associations, but of course there's a proliferation of associations. So commercial before the actual content, just to see who Scheffler is or are. Uh, maker of a bunch of different components, not just bearings. We make engine components, aerospace components, a bunch of different assemblies. A uh, pretty large company in Germany, but with presence around the world. So that's, that's the sales pitch, in case you're looking to invest into Scheffler. Again, we're uh, present all over the world, again, headquartered in Germany. I am in charge of the Americas, so North and South America. So most of my presentation and anecdotes and information are related to the US and South America, and vice versa. But if you have questions, global questions, feel free to ask. 
Here's some of the members of the ABMA. So if you know anything about bearings, if you've ever dealt with bearings, they're probably represented here, most likely. And if they're not here, they probably should be here. Uh, this is a representative sampling. There's, of course, other members as well. So uh, again, if you want to have any questions, I assume you're here because you already know bearings. It's not that you just showed up without any knowledge of bearings. But I'll, I'll go through a quick, quick example and quick description of why it's important. I'll keep this very brief because I assume, again, you have some bearing background, or at least there's a reason that you're interested and you're here today. So bearings are very, very precise components. Nobody thinks about bearings. You drive your car, you don't think about the bearings that are running your car. You don't think about the bearings in your computer fan. You don't think about the bearings in your, the train, plane, wherever you got here. But there's thousands of bearings, and they're high precision products, and they carry the load. Meaning, those things that roll along the road, the wheel bearings that carry you, the, the landing gear on your plane, the, the bearings in your jet engine, those things are carrying load and reducing friction. So they're a critical component, component in, and safety component in those systems. If they fail, and they're not made properly, you'll know it right away. There's a, it's, it's hard to miss a catastrophically failed bearing in a jet engine or in a landing gear. It's not like a plastic tab or something that happens to be there because an engineer wanted to put it there. This is a very key load carrying component. <clears throat> I, again, this is, you don't really need to know this. There's no exam at the end, but just a, a very simple ball bearing with a outer race, a retainer or cage, balls, inner race, and shield. Deceptively simple. Of course, the devil's in the details. So how those balls and uh, raceways and inner ring, outer ring interact, what the clearances are, what the finishes are, are the key component of a bearing. Again, devil's in the details. It can look great. It can, well, I can shine up a 50-year-old bearing and make it look really, really nice, but it doesn't work that well anymore. It doesn't have the load carrying capacity the uh, new bearing does, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, so there's different types of bearings, all types of bearings. Of course, there's not just ball bearings. There's roller bearings. There's spherical roller bearings. There's tandem ro ro uh, roller bearings. There's a bunch of different types of bearings to suit the application. So just because I, so I showed balls, the point is there's a bunch of different types of bearings. And they come in all sizes. So you can see the little fan bearing or little electrical tool bearing on the left, smaller than a tip of a pencil if anyone uses pencils anymore, and a gigantic six-meter wide specially made bearing for the channel uh, channeling project under the English Channel. So, gigantic, gigantic bearings, and very, very tiny bearings, and everything in between. So, in your, I assume, in some of your applications, you're going to see also a variety of bearings, probably smaller bearings, but you'll see a wide variety of bearings as well. And of course, they're precision products. So, what you want to see in a bearing is kind of on the right. You want, not that you want to see it. Let me correct that. You don't want to see that in a bearing. But as a mode of failure, you want to see a slow failure rather than catastrophic failure. One of the big concerns with counterfeit products is that they fail without warning. So if you get a product and you have a maintenance schedule, and the maintenance schedule is two or three years, two or three years, every two or three years, assuming that the life of the bearing is four or five years, and it fails after one year, that's a big problem. Because you have a scheduled two-year change, or you have a certain service life in a product, and it lasts much less than that, it's a huge problem. The other side of it is it gives you some warning. So if you're driving in your car and you hear, ee, or like that, you know, that squeaking sound, you have a, a faulty wheel bearing, it gives you warning. It doesn't just fail and the wheel pops off. Big difference. So here's an example of where bearings also are. So if you see, again, I think you know where these are, but when you see a windmill or you see these turning components, all these components here, let me see if I can, all these turning components are all supported by bearings. Bearings, bearings all over the place. So the point is, is that they function behind the scenes. They help move the world. And it's, it's kind of true. Not kind of. It is true. If there weren't bearings, you wouldn't be able to get here by car or plane and so on. There's just no other way around it. You have to have something that supports these components. So what are the safety risks? And I'll show you some examples in a second of, of stories and so on and anecdotes and uh, what happened in various raids. But... Because they're on all safe shapes and sizes, and they're not the sexiest component, nobody looks at a bearing and says, wow, I really wanted to get a bearing industry, or at least only a few of us do. But they're, uh, they're a very critical component, and they're a specialized component for that reason. And they operate behind the scenes. So, you know if you're, I guess there's only uh, men here, but if your wife goes walking around in, maybe not in Tampa, well, maybe in Tampa too, but in New York or something, you see the roadside 
or not the street side stand with all the purses and that, you know those are fake. You recognize that it's a Louis Vuitton bag or something. You know that it's, uh, I think in the video, how to dot us. I mean, you know these are fake and you're buying a cheap knockoff, which I don't support, but the point is you know that you're buying something. In this case, in most cases, and the reason for doing a presentation like this is that people are buying bearings, putting them into applications with no idea that counterfeits even exist. That's a very common refrain, even up until now, when I get a case. I just had one in March. We showed up to a distributor, and uh, actually it was a, several, distrib several locations of the same distributor, and they said, I, I wouldn't even guess that there's such a thing as a counterfeit bearings exist, which it's a little bit BS, a little bit. But the point is, um, there are people that are innocent victims of counterfeit bearings. So they get bearings, they assume, well, a bearing is a bearing is a bearing, and they put it in and it fails. And then they go to the manufacturer for a warranty, say this destroyed my system or something, and you, when they come back and say this is a counterfeit product, then you're out of luck. There is no warranty, there's no one to go to. And good luck finding a counterfeiter that's gonna support their counterfeit product. So it's a, it's a serious issue that at step one, and I'll say that in a second, is awareness is critical. Because if you know going in there and you, go, you know you're going on, I'm not gonna name certain uh, search tools or certain uh, marketplaces on the internet, but if you just go and buy the cheapest product, you're putting your products and your reputation and in some cases your life on the line. So, so uh, these are actual examples of, uh, all these pictures are actual examples, so they're not like some sort of stock images. These are actual raids, actual things that happen in China or elsewhere. Since 2012 to uh, fiscal year 2016, about 100,000 uh, bearings have been seized in U.S. Customs worth about $90 million. Now, 100,000 doesn't sound, it's a lot, but it doesn't sound like a crazy amount. When you, but when you think about where those applications would have gone or where the uh, safety risk in those applications were, we've had bearings seized that were supposed to go to landing gear in, plane, in planes, which is what I brought up earlier, that have gone to Navy destroyers, that have gone to uh, underground mining operations. These are serious safety issues, and thankfully they were caught before they were installed, or in, some, in one case actually failed, uh, which is another story. Um, actually, it's public now. Uh, I actually went to a Navy destroyer and uh, went out to sea, and the product failed. It was a shaft support bearing, so they actually had to get the ship brought back. Now, you want, you, obviously, that was a very serious case, and NCIS was directly involved in that one, so they, the government obviously takes it very seriously, but if there's holes in that supply chain, there's holes in everyone's supply chain. And you think about it, if they can take the risk of sending something out to, out to sea and failing you know, in a wartime situation, that's obviously they take it very seriously. And now it's, that was four or five years ago, so now it's a different situation. But in industry, this happens all the time too. The only difference is, is that these aren't well publicized and there, isn't, there aren't the resources because most people just want to move on with their business. They want to get going and change the product or get their money back. But there isn't any large consequence for the people that are selling this because they're often coming from China or India or smaller operations. So, um, so just some uh, counterfeit failure examples just to make it more relevant to the ESA. This was actually installed, uh, shockingly, on a large... This and, I don't know, maybe 200 other examples were installed on a large OE... No, uh, not the equipment was large, but the OE was large, the original equipment manufacturer was large and well-known, installed on their electric motors. Counterfeit bearing. It's an FAG bearing in name, of course, but it's actually a counterfeit bearing. So one thing that I took the slides out, because I assume that you know what it is, but just to make clear, a counterfeit is a bearing that has someone else's name that didn't make it, just so you understand, because there's some confusion between the two of what a counterfeit actually is because people don't understand maybe what a patent versus trademark is. But a counterfeit is Jerry made a bearing, and he put an Anton bearing on it, because I have a better reputation than Jerry. No offense, Jerry. And he sold it as Anton bearing. I didn't make it. I didn't license it. It's not my design. But he sold it, and he got the money for it. And, of course, if you go to Jerry and say, or if you go to me and say, hey, I bought this Anton bearing off, this, off the wherever marketplace, internet marketplace, if fail, I say, well, it's not my bearing. So I go and raid Jerry's house, and I say, Jerry, you made all these bearings, and he's marking not just Anton bearing, but Mike bearing, and Larry bearing, and 
mark and you know a bunch of different bearings on there. So there's the difference. It has FAG on it, it's a counterfeit product, and it, it failed in the field. Yes? What about bearings that are made by companies and sold to other companies to complete their product line? How does all that fit in versus a counterfeit? Because it's made uh, by one company, maybe labeled with their product number on it for them. Mm -hmm. So the question was, uh, what happens when, the, when a company, I guess, licenses or has a third party manufacture parts for them and then sells to that party? Well, that's different because you would assume that at least that company is authorizing that production, right? So they're licensing out either their design or they're purchasing products and they have some sort of quality inspection and some sort of requirements. And if in that scenario where I say, Jerry, would you sell me your brand bearings? And I will repackage them or put them in a system or whatever I got to do and sell them to my customers. Then the warranty goes back to me. So you can buy that product with the knowledge that, yes, you can come back to Anton and say, that bearing failed and I have to take responsibility for it. And I can go back to my known third-party source and say, Jerry, you messed up. I keep on picking on you, Jerry, sorry. You're, you're a fine manufacturer of bearings. Yeah. <laughs> you're a fine manufacturer of bearings, as far as I know. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Yeah. So I guess it relies on deceit as the intention. And yes. It's pretty difficult to prove, I guess. Uh, it's not that difficult because you know which, again, if you're, if Jerry, if there's, you'll see some examples later. If you see an FAG bearing or an ETA bearing, which is what Scheffler makes, and we know we didn't make it, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear whether it was intended to be deceitful or intended to be a false product or not. Like that's, that's how we identify the products. So again, a lot of it comes down to who's, <laughs> I'm a lawyer, so I'm sorry to say it this way, but who's going to back it up? A lot of it goes back to that, right? Well, who's, who's qualifying the design? Who's making sure the, the quality is good? And then who's going to back it up when it goes to the field? And the answer in all three when it comes to counterfeit is nobody, because why should they care? That's the gist of it, right? So you don't want to get, you want to have the quality inspection and the, the know-how to get it into the field so it doesn't fail, but in the unlikely event that it does, or well, in counterfeits it's a likely event, but in unlikely event that a bearing does fail, you want to be able to go back to someone and say, either you owe me compensation or you owe me a replacement product or X, Y, Z, whatever the situation may be. Does that make sense? So the question is, how do we know we're getting our hands on crap <laughs> before the failure? So I'll, I'll go through some uh, examples of that, but the, the gist is go to trusted sources. And by trusted sources, typically, I mean, uh, obviously I'm uh, an employee of a bearing manufacturer, so I'd say go to our authorized distributors. But if you have trusted sources that you consistently buy from and you know that they, they have a rock-solid supply chain, go to them. But the problem is you don't know where they're buying from. So I would say go to trusted sources because those people at least buy from the actual legitimate manufacturers and not just go to the open market and buy from, you know, Marcy from, I'm sure you've gotten these solicitation emails, or maybe you haven't, but Marcy from Juhi Bearing Company. I have the best bearings ever, and I make all products. I'm an authorized distributor of everybody, right? So that's, that's one. Two, if you have any suspicions, you go to the manufacturer and ask. So I'll, I'll go through that scenario again, but that's basically it have a, a really good purchasing practice. I think that's the easiest way. Uh, so here's just quick examples. So here's another example of a, of a failed product. A large bearing in a steel rolling mill in Chicago area. Uh, they didn't have, it, it was, again, this is the example of the two-year maintenance program. Two-year maintenance program, change, supposed to last two years, lasted two hours. And they missed, it wasn't just a small miss. Like, it, if you look at the, at the rollers, the rollers are actually, again, if you know anything about bearings, these are very small differences in rollers. You shouldn't be able to visually see the differences in rollers. We're talking about microns, a thousandth of a thousandth of a hair, you know, the diameter of your hair. You, you should not be able to see. I could pick up one roller or another and you can see the difference. And they miss lubrication ports, which in a high heat load environment like that causes this. 
So, of course, you get an angry call, call from some Chicago steel rolling mill guy screaming that you guys are not the best. I'll, I won't use the actual terminology. Crap is probably as far as I'll go. But, uh, and you have to tell them that it's counterfeit and then convincing them that it's counterfeit because, again, it's the same thing. Well, no, you guys are trying to evade something. No, this is actually counterfeit. I mean, we're a big company. We don't need to screw over a steel rolling mill in Chicago. Here's the biggest one I've ever had. This is a um, meter diameter, almost 3,000 pound serial Corolla bearing, gigantic bearing, used for uh, propeller support for freight ships, you know, cargo ships, for underground mining, for, um, this was actually, I believe, going, one of them was supposed to be going to a dock, uh, like a naval shipyard or something in Brazil, and the other one was going to some sort of mine in Brazil. So there's two bearings seized. Uh, this pictures of the same bearing, but there were two bearing C's. This is like a sixty to one hundred thousand dollar bearing, gigantic bearing, counterfeited. So you have to imagine that again. These aren't people. I'll show pictures of people that are in garages, putting together bearings, and there's some funny stories to go with it. But this involves some level of sophistication. So the corollary with this is that sophistication also means some funding, which also means some organized crime involvement. So. The problem here is that if you're selling this bearing as a no-name no bearing, and you're going to a uh, big, I don't know what, even how much it costs, but let's just throw out a figure, $100 million, $200 million cargo freight ship, right? Do you take a risk and buy this bearing for $50,000 because you found a, a great deal on the internet? Or do you go and just go to a regular source and say, we're out at sea, there's no way, I'm not changing this thing for, for 10 years, and buy the $60,000 bearing. Well, somebody obviously decided to buy the $50,000 bearing. It sounds crazy to me, but it happens. Some great purchasing guy says, I, I'm going to buy this, and boom, he bought a knockoff bearing. And well, they end up losing the money, of course, because good luck going back to Marcy and asking for that $50,000. Marcy's the one, you know, the solicitation email, just so we're clear go back to Marcy as Juhi Bearings and say, I want my $50,000 back. And Marcy turns into, I don't know who this is. I don't know. No, don't speak English. Sorry. So you have to be very careful, careful on what you're buying and when. But this is the biggest case I've had, and this was in the U.S. This was being transshipped to Brazil. And this is a scary one because it's at the Panama Canal, which was cool to visit. Uh, but they had these things. They used to have the Panama Canal uh, mules that would actually guide the ships next to the ships. So you'd actually have mules on either side, and they would like, guide the ships through the Panama Canal, because it's very, very narrow. Like, it's surprising. When you see these ships, that's actually, this right here is actually the end of the Panama Canal. You have like a three-foot gap with modern ships between the ends of the Panama Canal. It's not, we're not talking about gigantic river here. We're talking about tiny canal. And now they have these rail-operated, they call them mules as well, but they basically keep tension on both sides of the ship to make sure it's guided through without smashing the sides. Well... Even the Panama Canal purchased counterfeit bearings, and they installed them on this mule. So you don't, I don't have the video because it's YouTube, but if you see this poor guy here, <clears throat> the counterfeit bearing failed, and you can see there's a YouTube. You can go YouTube uh, Panama Canal mule, and you'll see it. It Basically, it fails, and the smashes into the side of the ship, and the guy thankfully jumps out, but the mule is completely destroyed. So this is, again, this isn't like an academic exercise. This isn't, I feel like, saving two bucks. This is some, for lack of a better term, idiot, took a risk with a little bit of savings and ended up destroying the mule and shut down the Panama Canal for a short period of time. So, and almost killed someone, more importantly. Almost, thankfully. <coughs> All right, so any questions on that so far? All right. So how do you detect it? This is nice and complicated for a 8.25 on a Monday. Uh, so I'll walk this through. The point is here is that the counterfeit, or the, let's say the bearing manufacturer is the source, is the, uh, put it, they put together the assembler of all, a bunch of different stuff, if you think about it. So we don't often, often make our own rolling elements, for example. We might buy the balls from someone. So we have high precision balls or high precision rollers, which we might actually make the rollers. It depends on the, on the product and so on, but we have rings that we make, we have cages that we make, we have seals that we may buy, and we put them together. We buy packages, we buy everything together, we put it together, 
quality test it, make sure it's working properly, design it properly, and send it out to the customer. What they figured out, what the counterfeiters figured out, is that if they split up all those different things, that they can get away with it. So they have the sophisticating bearing producer. And behind the bearing producer is probably someone in organized crime that is funding it and getting money from it. Why? You think, well, this is silly. You're being silly, Hinton. Well, or maybe you just think that generally. But why is that? Because it's, it's good money and it's low risk for them. Right? It's not, if you get uh, caught with $100,000 of counterfeit bearings, you're likely to get a slap on the wrist. In some countries, you may spend a few weeks in jail. You might get uh, damages from the company. Maybe, maybe that's it. If you get a, uh, caught with $100,000 of cocaine, you're going to spend a lot of time in jail. So $100,000 of bearings, virtually nothing. $100,000 of cocaine, uh, this is going to be bad on the video, but <laughs> comparing cocaine to bearings, like, hear me out. But you're going to get a lot more jail time. So there's a lot lower risk here, so they get into this. And how, I, how do we know this? Well, <clears throat> there's various reasons, but one of the, at least one of the cases, and this was, I think, two years ago, one of our um, association raids in China end, ended up going up to a large warehouse. Uh, there's a small manufacturing facility and a packaging facility. When they showed up at the warehouse, some, and I wish this sounds silly, but this is actually true. I'm not making this up. People in black cars drove up. They had a discussion with the police, and they said, the police came to our people and said, you should probably leave. And our people were, I wasn't there, but they were like, well, we're here for, to do something. They said, no, no, you should leave. And I mean, you should leave China. So I'm not kidding. They were on the airplane later that evening out of China. So the point is that they mess with the wrong people. So they went to the, the source, right? They found the actual target. No one informed them that this was like, these were the real bad guys and that they couldn't clean out the warehouse or whatever it was, so they had to leave. So this is a rare circumstance, but what it tells you is that there's something behind it. So anyway, the bearing producer is, makes a bunch of blank bearings. There's nothing inherently illegal about blank bearings. You can make, I can make bearings in my garage if I want, and if you want to buy them, I'll sell them to you. Blank bearings. You can do whatever you want. Where it becomes an illegal activity is when you transfer it to a marking shop or counterfeit box. That was just to see my... Just to make sure I was in there. Um, and when you send it to the marking shop or the counterfeit boxing operation, that's where the illegal activity happens because that's where the name is applied. So they have these warehouses where they have, let's say, you know, thousands of bearings, and they get an order from this counterfeit trader, Mr. X guy here, and they say, we need 1,000 FAG bearings. And they say, okay, 1,000 FAG bearings. So they mark them FAG and they send them out the door. Obviously, it's not really an FAG bearing. They're just marking it that way. Tomorrow, they get an order for 1,000 SKF bearings. They mark 1,000 SKF bearings. They put them in the right boxes and they send them out. So the, the difficulty here is that you're getting an email or people are getting an email from this counterfeit trader or more likely an intermediate source, even maybe a surplus house, saying, buy these bearings, they're great. Maybe they're sending an email to the surplus house and saying, they're great bearings, wonderful bearings. End up with an end user, it fails. So we go to the end user and say, end user, tell us who, bought it, who you bought it from. We bought it from this guy. Surplus house says, we bought it from this counterfeit trader. We go to the counterfeit trader, we do our investigation, show up at the counterfeit trader, and it's some guy or a group of people in a basement with maybe 100 bearings. And then you can find documentation maybe of the counterfeit boxing shop, but by then, the counterfeit boxing shop is, for lack of a better term, boxed up operations, and they moved elsewhere. So they separated on purpose. Again, it's organized. It's not like these are dummies. They know what they're doing. <clears throat> this, the counterfeit trader is. The counterfeit trader is. The counterfeit boxing operation, less so. The bearing producer, much less so. So they're not, they're not going anywhere. If you've ever seen... <clears throat> well, bearing producer, again, there's no evidence, unless you link them to the counterfeit boxing operation, there's no evidence that they're actually doing anything wrong. They're just making bearings. Thousands of bearing companies in the world. Nothing wrong with them. The problem is when you put... There was a case um, in Florida, actually, that they had... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Where the, the person, the person who was selling a kind of the distributor who was selling the counterfeit product, insisted that they had the same quality as our product. This, this was his whole argument. They had the exact same quality as your product. And we said, after the 50th time, 
Sir, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care if they're the same quality. You buy them with the same quality. Don't put our names on it. Because you're selling it to end users, and they're failing. So obviously, they're not the best quality. But they're failing, and they're coming back to us. So you're not allowed. I don't care if you think they're, the, they're better than our bearings. You can't put our names on them. He said, OK, fine. So after, in the process of discovery, like during this process of discussion, we, uh, we got emails from him that he sent to his supplier in China asking, well, are these actually Ina product? And the email back was, well, technically not. But if we put our own names on them, who would buy them? Which is pretty much should be the title of this presentation. right? Like, it's not that it's, these people know what they're doing. They're doing it on purpose, and they're screwing over the people they're buying from them. So anyway, um, this is what I talked about as far as trusted sources. Of course, brand owners sell to their own authorized distributors. Again, the line from WBA is trusted sources. So if you have a trusted source that you know has a bulletproof uh, purchasing strategy and they're not buying from just some random whoever solicitation email, then you're all right. Does that make sense? So this is the risky channel. And this is the clean channel. So this is to answer your question. And again, there is some overlap, unfortunately, so you have to be careful. And that goes for our distributors, too. So the one thing... If you ever uh, purchased from any source or anyone, of course you're going to ask, are they genuine? Now, after this presentation, you're going to say, are these, are these bearings genuine? You're, you're going to, that's your first question, right? Is it, is this, if it's not from an authorized distributor, are these purchases genuine product? Well, easy way for a counterfeiter to make it look legitimate is to send you a certificate that's signed by some X person that says, yes, this is the best quality ever. Stamped with the company logos, as you can see, actual uh, chops on there, uh, signatures will look like legit legitimate signatures, and in some cases actually are legitimate signatures. And what's crazy about this is that they send it and then they go with it. So they say, I got a certificate of authenticity or a certificate of origin, I'm going to run with it. Of course, if you actually read this, it's, you can tell that it wasn't an English speaker who wrote this certificate. It was, it was written like a solicitation email, like super best bearing ever, Again, that's in this particular case. But it does look like a legitimate certificate. And if you look at the names, uh, at least on the, on the Shuffler stuff, I can say, the power of cut and paste. So people can find old certificates, they can scan them, and they use actual signatures. They actually, I mean, they go to the, the, to the effort of putting actual signatures on there, of actual Shuffler employees. Now, they're five or six years retired, or maybe they don't work in that position anymore, but they were actual Scheffler employees. So these look legitimate, and unfortunately, I had a very long discussion with U.S. Customs that they were taking in bearing orders. They, we had a huge uh, success with U.S. Customs, by the way, on stopping imports. And then we saw that they dropped off last year. And we said, what the heck's going on? They just not, they fell off the face of the earth, but they, they dropped significantly. I said, well, U.S. Customs changed their procedure that we're not going to contact the manufacturer in all cases. So we're going to get these. We're, the, uh, how U.S. Customs works, they detain a shipment at the port. They're supposed to contact the manufacturer and say, is this a counterfeit product or not? So they, we have sus, uh, suspicions that this is a counterfeit product. You're supposed to get back to them, and then they do a seizure. So detention, first step, seizure, second step. What they've been doing is sort of an intermediate detention. So they do this detention, they contact the importer, and they say, is this legitimate product or not? Prove that it's a legitimate product. So they were coming up with these certificates. And U.S. Customs was saying, okay, good, we'll send them through. So hundreds of shipments got into the U.S. Well, I'm assuming hundreds. They won't tell me the actual figure, but I'm assuming hundreds based on the drop in, in seizures at U.S. Customs, based on counterfeit certificates. So, of course, they didn't think to go to the manufacturer and say, is this a legitimate certificate or not? Hopefully they do now, but U.S. Customs is a big organization, so you have to tell, just like in any corporation, you have to tell 15 people in order for the right person to get to actually distribute the information. So the problem is that, obviously, bearings got into the U.S. market. Kind of, well, we know there's kind of bearings in the U.S. market. But be careful what you're asking for. If you ask for this and you get it, still contact the manufacturer. Obviously, if you have suspicions... Enough to ask, is this legitimate product or not? And they send you this. I'd be this these are 99.9 percent .9 that they're counterfeit. If I see this, my my go-to is that it's counterfeit, not that it's that it's legitimate. Because very rarely do people send these certificates out. 
So always contact the manufacturer. That's to, to your point. How do you know? If you have suspicions, well, if you have suspicions, you probably shouldn't have bought from them. I would say that. So trusted source is the cleanest way because then you're, you're free, right? Then you're confident. If you have suspicions, contact the manufacturer and verify. And there's each manufacturer has their own, like ours is piracy at scheffler.com. Uh, there's actually, I forgot to say, there's brochures at the back uh, that show a guide, uh, some example cases and a photographic guideline. So grab them in the back before you leave if you want. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah, we have the same thing. Yeah, we have. Uh, what that relies on, though, is that there's a big supply in the market. So what you're saying is there's a, like a data matrix code or a QR code that's on the bearing and on the box. So you can scan it, and it's an individualized code. So each code that you scan is specific to that bearing. And the way it works is that if someone scans it in Iran, well, probably not Iran, let's say in India, and someone scans it in the U.S., and someone scans it in Brazil, it flags it. Or if someone scanned it in the U.S. 15 times, it flags it. So the point is that, again, the way counterfeiters work is they take a, a label or a, a code, and they're not going to go and individualize it. Why would they do that? It's a waste of time, and that's an actual manufacturing process. So they copy one version of it, and they apply it to thousands of different bearings. I mean, they might get more sophisticated at some point, but unless they know our internal tracking system, or how we, how we generate those codes, they're just going to put the same code on all of them. So what, how that works is you go into RAID, and I scan 15 of those, and they're all the same. Well, obviously, all those are counterfeit because they just apply the same code over and over again. But it's not bulletproof because the first time you scan a code, it can turn up green and it could be counterfeit. Does that make sense? So it's, it's a measure. And... Any measure that you, that's ever been applied to counterfeit products is somehow circumvented or eventually defeated by counterfeiters. So you can put a hologram on, they copy holograms. You can put on numbering, they, they um, match numbering. They, you know, they, they, they keep up with what the trends are. And they keep up with where detentions are. They keep up with where raids are. They adjust. It's not like this is a static enterprise where they're just like, ah, I just keep on sending it out the door. Like, I don't care. They're looking to make money. So they uh, change from freight shipments, for example, to air shipments. So you think selling, sending a 2,000-pound bearing by air freight would be crazy, but if you're making it for a tenth, and you don't care, a tenth of the uh, cost and you don't care about quality, you just throw it out, you spend $2,000 in air freight, and you're still making money because you just threw whatever product you want in there. Right? So this is, there are measures in place to combat and be able to identify products. But it's just a measure, right? So, uh, reporting counterfeits. So this is, again, let me see how much time I have here, 20 minutes. So reporting counterfeits, again, going back to the message, go to the manufacturer. Don't have your own experts in-house because you can't have an, our own exp, your own experts in-house. Even in Scheffler, we only have three confirmed counterfeit analysts in the, in the world. And we have 85,000 employees. So three experts in the whole world. Now we're going to train another two, uh, but that's an ongoing training process because we have, I don't know if you picked that up, but tens of thousands of different products that go back 40, 50, 60 years. And the reason that it's a concern that you have to know that what, where the products are 30 years ago is because we see old products in the market all the time. Now, I wouldn't recommend anything over than 10 years that you buy it because design changes, you don't know how it's stored and so on. But people buy old products all the time. And if the question comes to me, is that a genuine product or not? I have to say, well, it's a genuine product, but it's 30 years old. I still wouldn't recommend using it, but it's technically a genuine product. The problem is that you, there's no way you can have that expertise in-house. So again, if Scheffler only has three and maybe five experts globally, there's no way you can just look at it and pick it up and, and figure it out. I, I was going to bring a bunch of samples here, but getting a bunch of bearing samples on a plane is not... Uh, not easy, uh, especially when you don't have check luggage. So if you see 
counterfeit. Again, step one, figure out what the manufacturer, who the manufacturer is, who to con how to contact them and reporting them is taking good pictures, basically. So there's this reporting guide, there's this photo guideline that you can do, but basically this is just a, a quick overview of what, uh, what kind of pictures we're looking for. So if I get a picture of, you know, Matt all the way back there, and he says, is that Matt or is that someone else? I probably won't be able to tell you that. Because you need to really focus. If it's all the way across the room and there's a stack of 50 bearings, there's no way I can tell you whether it's counterfeit or not. So you need very detailed, very close-up photos. It's like we're basically we're either that or the physical product. So you can ship us the physical product if you want, or you can give us really good photos. So that's, that's the two different. So this is basically replacement of sending actual physical components. If you want to send physical components, you can. It's a failed bearing in a ship. There you go. <laughs> so again, uh, packaging. The different packaging types, and you, you think this might be, might not be relevant, but even how the plastic is, is packaged, the tape here, the uh, counterfeiters are very very free, very frequent. Is that like an electro dance party or something? Um, electronica festival is that what ESA stands for? Uh, so even the tape is is counterfeited sometimes. Um, anyway, markings on the bearings are important. So all these different features, again, if you want to figure out quickly, if you want a quick answer on whether this is counterfeit or not, very good three or four detailed photos is all we need, uh, and it'll be very helpful. Because we get these questions all the time from our salespeople that, does this look counterfeit or not? And it's, it's getting a lot better, but it used to be, again, a picture like over there on a table, does this look counterfeit? And it looks like a red blob. So there's nothing we can do with that. So if you can find something like this, this is, you get an answer hopefully within days. All right, any questions on that? Well, I mixed them up intentionally. So these are, I'm not telling you which ones are fake and which ones are, are genuine because I don't want, the, the issue is we used to have a training, and this is the one, of the, one of you is going to think of this question. Why don't you just have a training guide on how we can figure out, like a check the box kind of thing? And we didn't have that exactly, but we had sort of a quick overview of what to look for. We had a little presentation, highly confidential, only to our authorized distributors. This went to South America. Within two months, the counterfeiters were including it in their packages to, to customs in Peru and in Brazil saying, oh, we know it's genuine because look, we have this guide here that told us that it's genuine. Yeah, so obviously that didn't work. And then we see sometimes, because again, there's a couple of Shepler salespeople in the room, so I won't disparage salespeople, and I'm sure some of you are salespeople, but you want to make a sale. And you want to serve your customer, which are all great qualities. However, if a customer comes to you and says, why is this counterfeit? Give me the details. And then I've seen, again, even up to maybe three months ago, emails of horribly, from my perspective, horribly, probably from the customer's perspective, wonderfully detailed emails. But from my perspective, it's like cold pit in my stomach, kind of, you know, ugh, flu symptoms kind of thing. Detailed description of what this part number means and what this code on the bearing means and what, when, was this, when was this made and where was this made and what this code means and how this could be different. And it's like, oh my God, you just gave, that's, that's gold for a counterfeiter because they can look at it and say, oh, that's what that means. All right, and then they can fix it all, right? So, very scary. Um, anything, any other questions? Okay. So uh, any kind of activity. So you're asking to yourself, I assume, because you're at that point in the presentation, what are you guys doing about it? It's a big problem. You keep on talking to me about Anton. I go to trusted sources. There's a problem. What are you guys doing about it, though? All right. So we have, this is a very, uh, uh, this is something I came up with, and it's very, I know, advanced, the three-pillar approach, because three pillars hold up a table. Get it? So you can't just have two pillars. You've got to have three. See? Oh, you guys. Come on. First pillar, law enforcement contact and customs training. So uh, we can do civil enforcement, which we do, which means go to civil courts and sue directly distributors. Counterfeiting is illegal. So I'm, I'm IP director for the Americas. I work with mainly with patents, which is a totally civil related. If someone, if someone infringes our patent, I can go to them and sue them in a civil court. The advantage of counterfeiting, for us at least, or the disadvantage, I guess, for uh, counterfeiters is that it's actually an illegal act. It's a criminal act. Counterfeiting is criminal. It's illegal. So if you get caught counterfeiting, there was a case uh, very recently 
in March that you wouldn't think about it, but uh, one of our distributors, well, not one of our distributors, but a distributor, large, relatively, I would say medium-sized distributor actually for the U.S., was selling automotive uh, counterfeit products. Homeland Security got wind of it, we got involved, and we were involved in raids all over the country. So I know when we walked in, I said, why? Like, why is Homeland Security involved in, I know one of the guys said that, and it was one of those think, fodder I can use for a presentation. Why is Homeland Security involved in this? Couldn't you just call us? Like, no. You're, it's like you were selling pounds of cocaine out of your back door. I, I'm not getting involved with that. This is not my, this is a criminal act. I don't think you understand. You, took an, you didn't take it seriously, and you're joking around with what you're, what you're doing, and even there's like an email of him saying, yeah, whatever, you know. What's Audi going to do about it? But the thing is, it, these are criminal acts. Now, they're not as serious, of course, as other things. You know, uh, there's more serious acts than, than counterfeiting, of course, but it's still criminal. So getting law enforcement on board, and this is true pretty much internationally, getting them on board, and especially customs on board, and trained in what a bearing is and what the safety risks are and what they can do about it, is a huge step for us, and has been very successful in North and South America. Um, Second pillar is fast and effective action on the ground. And this isn't always easy because, again, for me, I'm the only counterfeit, anti-counterfeit guy in the Americas. It's just me. And there's a lot of territory to cover. So having fast and effective action on the ground is not so easy, but we try. And the third pillar, again, three-pillar table. Come on. It's, come on. All right. I thought it was got a little applause, no? All right. Yay. Um, trusted source, strengthening, and awareness. And what that means is... A, what I'm doing here, basically. That you guys know that there's a problem and that you can do something about it. So avoid the problem. Go to your trusted sources. Know what to ask. Again, knowledge is power. Right? G.I. Joe? You guys guys didn't watch G.I. Joe? No? Knowing is half the battle. All right. This is a raid, and I'm going to not translate translate this for you, but it's a huge raid last year, February 2016. Biggest counterfeit raid anywhere in the world, single raid, so 1.3, million U.S. dollars. Really and she's saying Anton is país. great, the free killer thing is it's genius, I don't know where he came up with it, the guy's just Cesar, incredible, si and I don't know why this guy is talking to you guys, but anyway, the point is, is that Vanessa Televidentes, pues según la información que maneja la policía desde hace dos meses venían haciéndole seguimiento a esta organización que logró poner en el puerto de Barranquilla este cargamento de repuestos usados. Fueron hasta el momento y judicializadas 12 personas, pero dice la policía y los expertos en este tema que comprar un repuesto usado tiene bastante riesgos. Uno, porque no se sabe con qué material se hizo, si es falsificado. Y segundo, que si es instalado en su carro puede tener en riesgo su vida y la de su misma familia. Okay, that's enough. I, I know, you, unless you guys understand Spanish, which I assume some of you do, I don't understand Spanish well enough that I can translate for you. <laughs> I, I can't uh, say I speak Spanish well enough that I could translate, but the gist is that there's a big case, and it made the, not, the evening news in Colombia. And it was, it's interesting, you think the Colombian market for Scheffler is something like 7 million US dollars, something like that, give or take. This was a $1.5 million raid in one warehouse. So we walk into the warehouse, and it's just floor to ceiling, Obviously, this is small compared to the warehouse, but just floor to ceiling counterfeit products. 95% of the products were counterfeit. So it's, you don't think that the problem is there. And once in a while, we'll go into a warehouse and you'll see 30% counterfeit or 40% counterfeit. And you think, well, they claim innocence. And they think, well, it's, I guess in theory it's possible they got onto a bad source. Again, they started trusting a source and they bought a lot from that source. And those tend to be, that tend to be, tends to be what happened. They picked two guys that they, that they uh, purchased from and they kept on purchasing from them and they were all counterfeit. Well, this guy was purchasing from, I don't know how he did it, but all counterfeiters. Like everybody he purchased from was just counterfeit. Like counterfeiter, 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 counterfeiter. And he claimed innocence. Of course, he wasn't. 95% counterfeit is a course of action, not a mistake. So, and it's, I don't know, I, I shouldn't say it, but this guy, uh, we raided, he has, he's actually a large operator in Colombia, and he has, uh, his main warehouse is in a certain city in the north of Colombia, and then there's different locations throughout that we've raided. So we've raided him probably 
eight times, and the guy doesn't get it. Um, so we're in, in the criminal courts with him and so on. But the first time was uh, interesting because he was actually at the warehouse. And it was one of those, I don't know, Spanish soap operas where he came out and he was yelling at, at, our, at the police, yelling at us. And then when he realized that Scheffler was there and the police were serious and were going in there, he started pre pretending like he was having a heart attack. It was, it was something. It was, it was a performance. Like, oh, oh. <laughs> and that's on video, too, for later for personal rights. That's, that's how I fake a heart attack. Oh, oh. Anyway, he didn't have a heart attack. I, it's funny because he actually didn't have a heart attack, obviously. But um, any, any questions? Oh, sorry. All right. So we do uh, trainings for customs officials all over the world. Uh, again, we have a kind of a problem all over the world, including in Germany. So if you get products from Germany, they have, we have kind of procedures in Germany too. So it's not like they're clean either, uh, even though we're based in Germany. It's easy for us because we're right around the corner, but yes, sir, in the back. Hi. Just wondering um, if we have any problems up in Canada or across. Yes. Yes, there's activity like this in Canada. It's, it depends a lot on the legal regime in each country. So the U.S. is great when it comes to enforcement. As far as uh, U.S. Customs, fantastic. They are uh, very professional. They know what they're doing. They know how to target things, and they're fast on the turnaround. Other countries, South American countries, uh, again, it varies. Chile's great. Colombia's great. Brazil is a little bit more difficult. Canada... In customs, it is extremely difficult to get something seized in customs in Canada. They've tried to improve it, but it's not virtually impossible, but it's, it's difficult. So you have to know where it's coming from. You have to know what's coming. You have to put a court order in, and there's a bunch of steps that are unreasonable, basically, to get an actual seizure. But there are enforcement activities, but they're, they're few and far between. But we have at least three cases of counterfeit products in, the last, uh, in this year so far. Well, what's interesting is that I get seizures going through, for example, Anchorage, Alaska, like FedEx facility in Anchorage, Alaska, going to Canada. But I won't get seizures at Canadian ports. So I had uh, three, three or four seizures going through Anchorage this year so far, going to Canadian facilities. Yeah, but not in Canadian customs. So it's just a matter of enforcement and how good the laws are and how good the enforcement is. But there, the problem, there's no, it's not like an island of uh, peace or something of counterfeit kind of products. It's, it's uh, just as bad as anywhere else. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've had many custom seizures and so on. Again, a lot of this originates in China. So if you're buying directly from China, I'd be very, very, very extremely, extremely careful to the point where I would say don't do it. Um, I don't know if you've ever purchased stuff even from Amazon or something where you, it all, oops. Hello. All right. Prestation's over. Get out of here. It's uh, cut me off right at the five minute mark. All right, let me just scroll through this really quickly. All right. As you're watching me, I can, or as I'm talking, I can scroll through this quickly. Yeah, shoot. Yes, of course. So is everybody else. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, it sounds like, I mean, you're, if there's another way, let me know. But you're kind of saying, really, the only way to prove this for sure is to go through, uh, either go directly to the manufacturer or go directly to a non-priced dealer. That, so, nothing else. So, the, so the question is, 
uh, just because they asked me to repeat the question, is that uh, people are trying to make, save money, of course. And he's saying, is, it, is the best way, what's the best way to uh, guarantee that you're getting legitimate product? Is it going to the manufacturer and authorized distributor? And my answer is yes, that's the best way. And the line from the WBA is go to a trusted source. So if you use someone for 20 years, and they've always been, always been consistent, then I can't tell you, don't use that source anymore. I'm not, I'm not legally able to do that, and I'm not suggesting that. If they have a solid purchasing practice, and you're confident in how they're purchasing, then you know, that's, the decision is yours. The best way, of course, is to go to the manufacturer or an authorized distributor. That is the cleanest way. That is the, how you're going to guarantee to get genuine product. And at least if you don't get uh, the best deal, you have warranty behind it. So that's what I can suggest to you. Further than that, I don't know, everyone's looking for a deal, and that's the problem. People look for a deal, and, then they, and those trusted sources look for deals too. So all you need is have one loose purchasing agent, one loose system, and they let these bearings in. Right, so it's, it's, it's a very dangerous, purchasing is a very dangerous practice these days because it's so easy to buy things from anywhere and you can find things anywhere. And likely the first thing, if you search out an FAG 12345 bearing on the internet, the first five sites are probably counterfeit sites. Probably. I've, I've heard of people who have dealt with bearings for years and years and years and decades and are particularly their authorized distributors or machine shops where they've dealt with bearings all the time and they just smell something's not right. So I'm not saying it's impossible, but I wouldn't rely on your own expertise. And those are the guys that have been working on the same bearing, same products for 20, 30 years, and they just, they just kind of know. Right? At some point, you just kind of have that feel, that intuition that something's not right. You know what I mean? Like the, the markings off, or the it doesn't. And I'm not kidding. It actually doesn't smell right. Like it actually the smells off. It, it doesn't smell like a proper bearing. They use different lubrication or different preservative or something. So we do get indications of that. So trust your gut, sure. But to be sure, to, to be certain, go to the manufacturer. Does that make sense? There's no. I can't give you a list because we make ten, hundred thousand different part numbers. So no, there is no way you can just look at a bearing and say it's for sure, for sure, genuine product or counterfeit. Yes, in the back. Uh, in, in terms of what, annual sales or? Yeah, uh, the, the accepted estimate, and we've talked about this a lot because, of course, you don't catch all of them, is something like 2 to 5% of our sales are lost due to counterfeit products globally. Which is, again, that's a lot. That's a significant. Oh, uh, well, there, it's shifting over time. So if you looked at seven or eight years ago, it was mostly smaller product, smaller, lower value product. But now they've shifted to medium and larger product, at least on the industrial side. Because again, it's greater profit margin for them, it's easier for them to make, right? It requires more sophistication, but it also is a greater profit margin potential for counterfeiters. So we've seen a shift over time. So uh, I think the actual split is somewhere between, I think it's something like 60% medium size, so 200 millimeters to, you know, say a 600 millimeter bearing, something like that. And then, uh, again, it depends on value that you're looking to. So if you look at quantity versus value, the quantity is much larger in the smaller bearings, of course, because you're going to have 10,000 of them. Value-wise, it's like 60% medium maybe 30% larger bearings, and then 10% is the smaller stuff. Yeah, but again, you're talking about a $2, $4, $5 bearing versus a $50,000 bearing. It takes a lot of $2, $4 bearings to make a $50,000 bearing. But there's a lot more on the market. So I only have a few minutes left, but if you guys have any questions, um, basically all the rest is just enforcement. This is what it looks like in China, and we do these kind of operations all the time. We've had, uh, I don't know, 10, I think, or something, 9 or 10 so far this year. Smaller, but they're, they're around. So if you hear something, contact me, contact the manufacturer. If you have any questions, this is the, the closeout of the presentation. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.